have. So uh, uh, just before we begin, uh, guys, I would be muting everyone uh, throughout the talk. I would request everyone to please uh, turn off your webcams when once the talk starts, uh, at least uh, except the speaker, because that would help us conserve the bandwidth which we have. And, uh, oh. Hi, Tej. Hi there. Hey, Ashish. How are you, man? Good you. Very good, thank you. Ashish, so one minute later, one minute pehle teri yaad ki thi. Good to see you. <laughs> Are, I was cutting some salad for the wife. Uh, you know how this lockdown is. <laughs> uh, Ashish, you've been going to the gym lately? Priorities, right? Uh, no, yeah. No gym, no nothing. <laughs> you, look, you, look, you look much more energetic than me. <laughs> That's just because I did a crew cut. Ah, okay. <laughs> and, and I am still inspired by JVD, sir. Oh, you have a long way to go. <laughs> yes. For the top like, of your hair or the bottom part? No, 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 the top of the hair. The bottom part, I'm, I, I want to be inspired by you or Humayun, by, of course. <laughs> if you are going to look at me, then you have to, then you have to think about a little, take a little, little bit. I am on the halfway stage. <laughs> True. True. Think so. when, when by long way to go, you are not in halfway. You are always the warrior, Falcon. I time lagta hai, Baba. Lamba hone ke liye, what time lagta hai? Nosh is also here, Tej. <laughs> yes, I see Nosh. Happy to see him here. Hi, Nosh. Hi, hi, Ashish. Hi, Tej. And hi, everyone. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Lovely getting together. Yes, so it's almost time. Uh, so yeah, it is, I think. Hello, everyone. I would be just uh, muting everybody uh, right now. Just give me one moment. <coughs> What's Australia is doing behind you? Page. These are the oyster catchers that nest on our roof. <laughs> cool. <laughs> and here you can see one of them has a yellow band. That's a female that we ringed uh, in 2016 and it nests on our roof every year. Unbelievable. Yes, it's very unusual for these oyster catchers, which are normally ground nesting birds, now to be ne nesting also on the roof. Uh, but we found uh, last year in the Netherlands, maybe up to 20% of the national population were nesting on flat roofs. Oh. Which is quite amazing. And the success on the roofs is higher than the breeding success on the ground where the birds are exposed to a number of ground predators and uh, agricultural practices, which means that their young are at a high risk of being killed. How do the young get down to the ground? That is the... The young uh, can fall down to the ground, uh, just uh, sort of parachute down uh -huh. after a few days to two or three weeks, depending on the pressure and um, uh, as in pressure of predators or what the parents uh, tell them to do. But we are also learning that birds, these young birds can fall down when they are a, a week old and they can break their legs. They can also die if they fall on the concrete. So where the buildings and uh, flat roofs are next to gardens and uh, uh, grass, there the birds can fall into the grass and they survive the fall, even if it's up to five floors. Oh. So yeah, we've got buildings in our area where... Uh, I'm sorry, so I think it got muted, everyone. Um, Ashish, sir, you have to unmute. No, they could hear. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah we, are, we, are, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah that's it. <clears throat> yes, so it's interesting how the birds are trying to adapt to uh, the changing situation on the ground. And this uh, species, as with many of the other water birds, are declining. Uh, in the region and the oyster catcher is one where the declines have been a little faster than some of the other species. 
and uh, we know what the reasons are. There's a lot of predation by foxes, uh, by uh, birds of prey, uh, buzzards and goshawk and others, as well as uh, uh, hedgehogs have been filmed eating the eggs of the birds um, of oh. ground-eating species. So it's very interesting. And agricultural practices and the water conditions in the fields dictate uh, food availability. So the oyster catchers, although their names are oyster catchers, when they are inland, there are no oysters to eat. So the only things they are eating are really um, earthworms. Ooh. So they feed in grass fields and in uh, crop fields and along streams and lakes where there is soft mud, where they pull out the earthworms and feed them. And also another little um, uh, something called a leather jacket. It's the, it's the pupa of the... Um, of the fly, the mayfly. It comes on a Yamaha. Sorry? Does it come on a Yamaha leather jacket? <laughs> <laughs> well, they remain underground for a long time and then they, uh, these are, they're quite small, so they're good prey items for the young oyster catchers. We had such discussions about the lapwings nesting on roofs in India, I remember. They were famous. Yes, yes. They were they were nesting on on a college roof in Pune on the fifth floor as well, and many of the chicks died when they fell down as well mm. because it was onto concrete uh, paths around the building. So yeah, birds are trying to survive, but uh, people are changing the environment far too fast for most species to manage. Unfortunately, in a couple of generations, maybe you will have them nesting only in houses which have gardens around them. So Could that the chicks survive the fall. Yeah. So, um, so shall we? Yeah. So, um, hello, welcome everyone and uh, happy International Mangrove Day to everybody. Our today's speaker is uh, Dr. Tej Munkar. And to, do, to introduce him, I would like to ask Humayun Tahir to introduce him, please. Humayun Mai, over to you. And uh, good evening, everyone. And it is a great privilege and an honor to introduce you to Dr. Tej Munkar. Uh, he is the senior technical officer with Wetlands International, based out of the office in Netherlands. Uh, Dr. Munkar, he has a doctorate, doctorate in water bird ecology from Saurashtra University. And uh, he has focused his work on the breeding and feeding ecology of water birds of the Gulf of Kutch and Saurashtra. He holds a master's degree in microbiology and is also a counselor for Asiatic fauna to the Convention of uh, Migratory Species and chair of the CMS Flyways Working Group. Uh, Dr. Munkar started his career with uh, Wetland International in Malaysia, which was then the Asian Wetland Bureau. And uh, he has over 27 years of international experience in many areas, such as uh, the program and project development, management and technical implementations, promotion of wetlands and water bird conservation at global flyway and national levels, uh, also in ecotourism planning, environmental education, and awareness raising. He has also developed and coordinated the asia Pac Migratory Water Bird Conservation Strategy, which is the largest international cooperation framework for migratory water birds and their habitats in the region. And in the late 2000s, he also helped the uh, FAO, UNFAO to build their program to strengthen the capacity of uh, veterinarians and wildlife staff in the wild bird disease monitoring for Asia, Africa, and Europe. And although his work largely focuses on water birds, he is also keenly interested in a wide range of other awareness raising programs, research, conservation issues related to wetlands, wildlife, and environment. And he has published uh, several papers and articles on various subjects in several different forums. Uh, I can't resist this, but on a more personal note, Dr. Munter has been associated with the AWC count since the early 90s. And on many occasions, he's been highly complimentary on the work being done by Deccan Birders, which was uh, BSA earlier. Uh, we, we have a few firsts to our credit mm -hmm. in the AWC exercises, and he's always been highly supportive of the work we do and of our record keeping. Uh, so, on the occasion of World Mangrove Day, I don't think we can have a better, we can look for a better speaker and we 
look forward to his talk on the conservation of coastal water birds mangroves and interdigital plants so uh, welcome to the forum tej and uh, over to you thank you many thanks uh, humayun for that very very detailed <laughs> introduction it's my great pleasure to speak to deccan birders and many thanks to the kind invitation from mr murthy and uh, all of you um i am based now in the netherlands and sitting in my house uh, in arnhem which is in the east of the country and uh, we have been out of the office for the last 3 months uh, working from home because of the uh, corona um pandemic which means that we've had to find new ways to deal with conservation locally nationally and internationally and like everyone else we are trying our best to make sure that we can continue to encourage people facilitate action and uh, provide the latest information that is needed to develop conservation action locally and internationally and i think um talks like this webinars uh, that you've organized really are extremely important and timely that uh, provide us with a platform to share information and i hope that some of the information i provide you today is food for thought for how things could be done both uh, locally within um, andhra pradesh and telangana but also within the country and uh, abroad um, i'm happy to answer questions at the end so um let's uh, let's start i'm just going to share my screen hopefully that works okay i hope you can see my screen now yes yes sir thank you yes, so <clears throat> i've picked a topic which uh, is quite um, appropriate for today which i think uh, as i go through it will become quite obvious as to what the close links are between water birds and mangroves and mangroves that grow on mud flats and are associated with mud flats and the importance of these habitats working together for species and people as was mentioned today is the international mangrove day i'll talk a little bit about that talk about what mangroves are and intertidal mud flats mangroves mud flats and the water bird connection talk a little about the tools that are being made available to support action prioritization and some of the international actions that encourage support and bolster local action because without local action nothing can happen but what are mangroves well as you can see here mangroves are trees or they could be shrubs they grow in this very special habitat of the coastal areas which we call intertidal areas and they survive in waters that are quite uh, fresh to salty or saline to in between which we call brackish globally there are about 70 species of mangroves that grow in the tropical and subtropical areas in asia africa latin america south america um but with these mangroves you also got a number of associated species and there must be several hundred mangrove associates uh, which makes the mangrove environment extremely diverse in terms of the species richness of plants obviously with these plants you get large numbers of other species and i'll talk a little bit about those as well some of the largest mangrove patches are or in terms of countries indonesia is number 1 brazil australia nigeria mexico are some of the other countries with a lot of mangroves uh but uh, india and bangladesh together have the largest contiguous mangrove patch uh, which is the sundarbans these mangrove trees are special because they survive in salty water and to do that they've got uh, an impressive filtration system that allows them to either block the uh, block the salt coming in or once the salt is in their system they can ex exclude them or even extrude them so sometimes on the mangrove leaves you can see salt crystals that are released through the uh, through the leaf besides what you see above 
what is below the ground is also extremely impressive and these are large root systems that can go out several hundred meters sometimes um, around a man large mangrove area and because of this these roots help to hold the ground the soil and to stabilize them and to reduce the impact of erosion from waves or if waves are normal but you can also get uh, tidal waves or tsunamis and these mangroves act as a very good protection against them um, we have uh, seen lists of mangroves in about 123 countries and territories and even though they seem to be quite widespread in these tropical and subtropical areas they actually represent a very small proportion less than one percent of tropical forests worldwide uh, and in terms of overall forest it means less than 0.4 uh, of the global forest what's called the estate um, these these global uh, statistics can be very confusing and change over time because constantly our information is being updated, new forests are being planted, forests are being lot, lost at alarming rates. And for example, in 2016, an estimate of mangrove coverage was about 1.7% of the world's 1. nearly 3 million kilometers of coastline. Also, what has uh, been noted is that mangroves are disappearing faster at perhaps uh, three to five times faster than the average forest loss globally. And this means that we are losing a lot of the important services and functions that mangroves play um, where they exist for the local people, for local economies, as well as for the environment and nature and people and uh, biodiversity such as birds. In this picture, you can actually see mangroves regenerating. You can see these plants growing along the water's edge. And what, what is clear is that when mangroves are given a chance, they come back, they will survive. All it means is leaving the land alone and reducing the pressure of human, uh, human pressure or, or interference and mangroves can regenerate quite well in most conditions. I'll talk a little bit about that later. But mangroves are also, the mangroves and the associated mudflats, the intertidal mudflats are very important for a range of water bird species and other biodiversity. And I'll just run through the different groups of species that depend on this complex habitat. So here are a group of uh, shorebirds. Uh, in this case, these are lesser sand plovers. On the top, you can see the uh, LC. LC means least concern. This is the IUCN red list category of the species globally. Besides feeding on the mud, the birds are also dependent on the mangroves for many purposes, including roosting at the high tide time or nesting in these mangroves or other species of mangrove birds depend on the flowers of the mangrove uh, for nectar and also for the insects that these uh, flowers attract because normally the mangroves flower at one time and that means there are a lot of flowers a lot of nectar and a lot of food um, a food pulse if you if you may uh, that attracts different species and it attracts uh, birds and insects but also it attracts a number of bats uh, so there's a lot of there's a lot of interesting life within the within the mangrove plants and within these coastal uh, ecosystems. I'm broadening the, the discussion here, so not just focused on mangroves, but the intertidal habitats that the mangroves are part of. You have a variety of different uh, mammals, uh, uh, such as the, the monk seal. And in red uh, is the text that explains what is the problems with the conservation of these species. So for example, this endangered species suffers from habitat loss deterioration, displacement, persecution, and unpredictable threats from disease and algal blooms. I'm not reading all the text here because I'd just like to give you a flavor for the species. And in the waters in India and in many other countries uh, in the Indian Ocean region, we have uh, the beautiful dugong, uh, which depends on seagrass beds in the intertidal and the shallow waters adjoining the intertidal beds. 
big problems for this species in many places because of the loss of feeding areas, um, injury from boats because more and more people are using faster boats and these propellers can, can slice the poor animals. Uh, there are a lot of them are being trapped in nets, fish nets, either intentionally or unintentionally. And uh, in some countries, they are being hunted as well. Besides that, you've got a variety of the turtle species uh, that use these intertidal habitats. Uh, these could be the uh, hawksbill or the green turtle, which are species found in India, or the olive wrigley. So these are, these are an important part of the intertidal fauna. You've got uh, a variety of fish uh, species, and uh, here's an example of a ray, uh, which is vulnerable. Again, uh, it's being caught and eaten in large numbers, and the feeding areas are being disturbed. And then you've got the most impressive fish, the whale shark, which is an endangered species and is, um, is suffering from thin trade uh, under the guise of uh, it being part of the shark family. Um, and uh, this, this species is one that uh, India and many of the other countries in the region are, are now set to protect under an agreement within the Convention on Migratory Species. Besides, um, besides that, you've got species that feed only at a certain time of year in uh, shallow coastal waters. Otherwise, they are in very deep waters or they're in fresh waters. So they depend on this interface of the uh, shallow coastal waters uh, mm -hmm. for, to complete their life cycle. And um, this is the example of the European eel. In India and in many of the other countries, the intertidal waters are also um, important feeding areas for uh, dolphins and porpoises. Here you've got the famous Iraudi dolphin. And no, uh, last but not least are all the fish. And you've got tens of thousands of species of fish uh, worldwide in these waters, which are home to them. They live there throughout the year, or you've got some species that are also migratory and move in and around. Uh, the area. Besides that, you've got predators like uh, birds um, that feed or nest in the mangrove areas. This is a uh, great blue heron in Florida. A large number of these species, unfortunately, are threatened, and this relates to only the migratory species that are listed under the Convention on Migratory Species, or CMS, or also called the Bonn Convention. So you've got and these are the categories under which they are threatened. We don't really need to go into the detail, but it's just to show you that there's a large number of species that are threatened. Um, India hosted the last meeting of the Conference of Parties of the CMS Convention in Gujarat in February. And I must say it was an excellent meeting that moved forward the agenda for conservation of migratory species of uh, animals, of uh, turtles, of fish, as well as migratory birds. And the Prime Minister of India made the announcement that conservation of migratory birds in the Central Asian Flyway is a priority for the Indian government. And we hope that that translates into action over the next years uh, so that there is a good framework for international cooperation as well as for conservation and action within the country. A little bit about why we need to protect mangroves and the mangrove ecosystem. In this diagram, it quite simply tells you that they're important for fisheries, for timber, for fuel, for clim climate regulation, for water purification, for tourism, for coastal protection. In addition, these are the human uses really of the wetlands, but in addition, they are, as you've just seen in the last slides, important for a wide range of species of animals and birds. So mangroves are extremely important, and yet we are losing them in many countries. If we divide what services they provide, just building in a little more detail of what you've seen in the last image, uh, we could classify them into what is pop popularly called ecosystem services of wetlands. And I won't go into the details here, but it's just to show you that it is uh, the highlighted ones where uh, you see the ecosystem services, it talks about the functions of coastal wetlands 
and they are extremely important for a wide range of uh, activities mm -hmm. that ensure that the coastal systems survive, maintained, and improve in quality and, and provide a service for humanity, a wide range of services, actually, I should say. And here, uh, this talks about the detail um, in various categories um, to humanity, really, in terms of uh, source of food, also a source of food for a range of other species. The next area is the mangroves in terms of their role for climate uh, mitigation. This is something that has caught the interest of more and more people in the last uh, few years and decades, and that's because people are recognizing with climate change, one of the main issues is with carbon, uh, the overproduction of carbon through burning of fossil fuels mainly. And what is it that we can do to try and protect carbon, to keep carbon in the ground? And plants are a very good way to do that. And mangroves are known to be really very efficient in storing carbon. Uh, the estimates vary considerably depending on the area, but on an average, uh, mangroves are believed to store or recorded to store up to over 3,700 tons of carbon. So that's a lot. And if that carbon or if that, mang that mangrove area is destroyed or degraded, then it becomes a source of carbon, which mainly means that the carbon dioxide, which is or the carbon which is currently locked in the soil, can be emitted into the air as carbon, uh, carbon dioxide. And what we are finding out is quite worrying that even though mangroves cover a very small area, um, the, the, the carbon em emissions from mangrove deforestation can be up to 10% of the uh, emissions due to deforestation globally, even though they really occupy a very small land area, which again talks about their importance in terms of storage of carbon. We've learned uh, through experience in the last decade and more uh, really how important mangroves are in uh, coastal defense. Uh, this, the tsunami in 2004, December, uh, the, the, num the, the number of other um, uh, storms that we've had um, and cyclones in the Bay of Bengal or um, in other places have shown us that where mangroves are along the coast, they are a natural barrier to the uh, strong winds through the waves and they can protect the land, they can protect the people, they can protect uh, uh, construction and uh, property. So they are extremely important to protect us. And there are calculations that a 500 meter strip of mangrove can reduce the wave heights uh, up to between 50 to 99%. So they are really a very good a way to protect ourselves as a natural coastal defense. <clears throat> Unfortunately, things are not stable in the world. And what we are seeing is that um, with the loss of, um, with the uh, heat, uh, temperature rising, with the loss of the uh, polar ice caps, both in the Arctic and in the Antarctic, uh, sea levels are expected to rise. And they won't rise equally around the world. They won't rise e equally also in terms of time around the world. Some areas will be affected more than others. And a recent study in 2019 showed, for example, in Mumbai, um, on the left here, you can see what is called the old projection, which some small areas were expected to be inundated in by the year 2050. A recent study showed by modeling that actually a large part of South Mumbai would be affected as well as this area uh, and here in, in a more intense way than the previous projections, which really means that we, has, we have to, as coastal communities, start thinking of how can we better plan where we're going to live into the future so that uh, investments and uh, live, livelihoods and property is not lost to sea level rise. It is happening, unfortunately and we need to be prepared for it. This seems to be what happens at a local level, and that's uh, worrying enough, but if we 
if we look at a much larger scale, for example, the entire Mekong Delta, which is uh, the end of the Mekong River, which flows into um, the South China Sea through Vietnam, you can see here the old projection was uh, fairly extensive, but the new projection for 2050 shows a much larger area. In fact, the entire uh, Mekong Delta being submerged, as well as parts of uh, or nearly half of Ho Chi Minh City, a huge metropolis in southern Vietnam, uh, which is expected to be flooded, as well as these waters are going all the way into Cambodia. So these are, these are worrying predictions that we have to be aware of, which means we have to start planning now in how we deal with uh, these changes long term. It may not happen, everything may not happen by 2050, but it, it's uh, undoubtedly going to happen uh, in the longer term in some places uh, and maybe even earlier in other places. So we need to start planning at the national and local level now. And coming to this day of the International Day for the Conservation of the Mangrove Ecosystem, this was uh, a special day adopted by the um, General Conference of UNESCO in 2015, and it's celebrated annually on 26th uh, July. And the aim is to raise awareness about the importance of mangroves as a unique and vulnerable ecosystem and to promote actions for their conservation. It actually gets um, it gets a boost, unfortunately, by and commemorates the death of a person wh whose name was uh, Heho Daniel Nanoto, uh, who was a Greenpeace activist, who in 1998, when he was working with the local community in Ecuador, they were trying to protect an area of mangroves that had been uh, converted illegally into shrimp ponds. And in trying to, trying to protect that area, um, unfortunately, uh, Daniel uh, lost his life. And to remember him and his efforts and the efforts of local people and to use uh, that as a boost for raising awareness, every year activities are now being organized around this day and this week. And for example, if you haven't seen it already, this has been publicized quite a lot by the Mangrove Action Project. This year has been uh, also one for a special photography award. And if you look at the images uh, that are being shared on this uh, website, you would be just astounded as to really how beautiful um, and varied the mangrove uh, coastal ecosystem is and how important it is therefore to protect it. I've used the words mangroves into tidal mudflats uh, and others, and it may be quite confusing, uh, so just to, to explain what that is, I'm going to put that in context of what is a wetland. And uh, this definition of wetland is a very strict definition in the sense it is what the Convention on Wetlands or the Ramsar Convention has used and countries including India, most countries of the world are parties to this convention. And this definition um, talks about the varied types of wetlands from natural wetlands to artificial wetlands, permanent wetlands to temporary wetlands, areas that have water which is fresh or brackish or salt, including areas of marine water to the depth of which at low tide does not exceed six meters. So that actually covers quite neatly the whole coastal area uh, because we know that estuaries bring fresh water and that becomes uh, gradually salty or brackish. You also have very salty water in salt pans along the coast. And in, on the coast, you have, um, well, coastal and marine waters are saline. In addition, Ramsar area or areas that are designated by governments as internationally important for conservation are areas that not just meet the definition in the first paragraph, but also are adjacent areas because sometimes you cannot pragmatically manage an area without managing areas that are adjacent, which are deeper. So uh, fortunately, uh, the convention offers a chance for governments to better manage their wetlands. And as the definition says above, these are wetlands that are both natural and artificial. Well, what are artificial wetlands? Artificial or semi-artificial wetlands? 
uh, or semi-natural wetlands are those wetlands that have been created by people. So those could be fish ponds or salt pans or sewage ponds or reservoirs in large lakes um, created uh, for hydropower or other purposes, as well as rice fields. So wetlands really cover any area where there is water, either permanently or temporarily, or even sometimes when I say temporarily, it could be once in five years because you've got wetlands in arid areas which don't receive water every year, but yet they cyclically receive water and when they receive water, they support a lot of life. How can we use this better to protect our wetlands in India and elsewhere? Well, the governments came up with what's called a strategic framework and a guidance. And um, if you can just uh, put that into Google, it'll immediately give you the information on how can uh, governments better use the convention for protection of uh, wetlands of international importance. Which are the wetlands of international importance in India at the moment? Well, um, there are 39 wetlands that have been designated as Ramsar sites. Uh, because of the projection, the wetlands of uh, the northernmost part of India, Jammu and Kashmir, are um, hidden. So uh, you won't see them because I'm trying to focus here on the coastal wetlands. So out of 39 wetlands, the government has so far designated five wetlands, which include small or large areas of mangrove. But these are only a small part of the coastline which support mangroves and other important wetlands. And it's really um, quite critical to try and encourage better management of all coastal wetlands and where possible to be designating and protecting them as Ramsar sites. If we look at coastal wetlands through another lens, what is the area of intertidal area that uh, these wetlands cover. And this was a recent uh, study published by Murray and others using 30 years of satellite images from around the world. This was an amazing project and it helped to identify areas where there is high uh, intertidal areas. And of course, the more intertidal areas you have, the more intertidal uh, areas support mangroves or mudflats. And so these, this map is quite an important one. It goes far as 60 degrees north because that's where the satellite images are most easily accessible and available. But that does not mean that the, 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 the Siberian coast or the northern coast of uh, uh, Canada or Alaska and Greenland don't have uh, tidal flat systems. They do have them but they're not covered through this, uh, through this presentation or this image, imagery. And you can see that uh, India's coast, coastline, both on mainland India, as well as the island systems of the Lakshadweep, um, as well as uh, Andaman and Nicobar, show up in this, uh, in this map, because they're, they're a very important contribution to the world's intertidal uh, habitats. If we now move on to the birds of the mudflats and coastal areas, this image here shows you what most people would see when they look for birds on the coast. They're little brown things running around in large flocks, sometimes very difficult to understand what's going on. And to, to understand what's going on, you really need to use binoculars or telescopes or sit quietly in one place and the birds will come to you. And you will see that you have an amazing array of bird species that can be using your area. These are all shorebirds, but in addition, you've got other groups of water birds also using the intertidal areas uh, around mangroves, but also where there are no mangroves. And if you start looking in closer detail, you can see that these different species may have different shaped beaks, different shaped legs. The sizes of these birds are different, uh, and the way they walk around is different. And these all these characteristics help you to identify that these are different species and the way they are feeding and walking around often means that they are feeding on different kinds of food, which then means if different species are feeding on different foods, then without competing or without competing too much, you can get very large congregations of birds on these intertidal mudflats. And indeed, that's what you see in many areas 
in, in, in India and other parts of the world, that these productive mud flats hold thousands to tens of thousands to even half a million birds, um, and that's quite a spectacle. These birds, because they are feeding in what's called the intertidal area, it means that when there is a low tide, the water goes out and exposes the mud flat or the sand flat below, and the birds feed on organisms in the, in the shallow water or in the wet mud, um, or even sometimes into the deeper mud uh, in these areas. And when the tide comes in, the birds are forced to go and rest. Uh, we also call that roosting, and this, the birds may roost just at the edge of the high tide, especially where they're not uh, disturbed by people or uh, dogs or um, other, other reasons. So the birds go through a daily cycle of feeding and resting, completely controlled by the tide. And as we know, the tides are going on day and night. So sometimes the low tide is at night and the birds will come to feed uh, in what seems almost complete darkness. On moonlit nights, you seem to have more activities of some species, and uh, otherwise the birds are dependent only on the diurnal uh, low tides. When they are feeding uh, in the low tide, as I showed you in the last image, they can be roosting right next door uh, to where they are. But in many cases, because of human development, there aren't enough safe high tide roosts where they are feeding. So for example, in this image, and this image is in, taken from uh, Singapore, where you've got the famous Sungai Bulo wetland reserve. This large area of mud, uh, mangroves has been an important uh, area for conservation of birds. And through studies, they realized that these birds are not only feeding in the park, in the shallow ponds, but they're also swim, uh, flying out to nearby mudflats of Mandai. So if you look at the kilometer scale, you can see it's a short distance, a few kilometers. They are feeding here at low tide, and when the tide is high, they, f oops, sorry, they fly back to roost in this area where they are protected because it is a wetland reserve. And this flight to and fro happens during every high tide, low tide cycle. This is a short distance, but uh, in other places, birds are required to fly several kilometers, and sometimes the birds may fly up to 30 kilometers or perhaps even more uh, through this tidal cycle. And this means that the further the birds need to fly to find a safe roosting space, it means they're using their energy uh, to fly unnecessarily. Ideally, the birds should feed in an area, and at high tide, they should be able to roost close by. And then at the next low tide, they can fly out to the low tide area and feed there again. But this extra commuting of up to 30 kilometers means that a lot of the energy that the birds are gaining through the food that they feed in one tidal cycle could be lost through this flight back and forth. This uh, this is an important thing to mention because uh, as we are lose, losing coastal areas, we are losing coastal areas because of areas being built up through construction of uh, fishing harbors, uh, industrial complexes, towns, cities, airports, whatever. And as a result, these birds are may not be losing feeding areas, but they're losing roosting areas. So although the area seems ideal for the birds and many people say, well, we're not damaging the intertidal areas, they are safe. The intertidal area is of limited value to the birds if the birds don't have a safe roosting area. And if they are forced to fly, like this image shows up to 30 kilometers, that's quite, an, uh, quite a flight for them uh, to do. And here in between, you can see mangroves. So they cannot all land in the mangroves. Some species can roost in mangroves, some species of shorebirds, but many of the shorebirds prefer to rest on the ground in open areas. This image, by the way, is uh, in, uh, from Sh Sri Lanka on the north side of the Manar um, Bridge. 
which is an extremely important area for water birds and uh, several hundred thousand mm -hmm. shorebirds to perhaps even quarter of a million have been seen here some years ago. Now, when these birds are feeding on the coast, they are flying inland. Sometimes that means they fly into areas where people are uh, building wetlands. So these are salt pans. These flamingos, which feed on the coast, are flying in at high tide. You can see that there are a lot of power lines here. It means that these birds are at risk of being electrocuted or uh, dying from collision and an accident. So uh, these are some of the risks that these birds are facing in flying to non-natural wetlands to feed or to rest. So if we put this into a slightly bigger context, we can see here that birds regularly will move between natural wetlands, either protected areas, for example, this is a nature reserve to a non-protected area or a local water body that's part of a farm or an area of, of agriculture. And these are the regular movements of birds on a daily basis or sometimes within a day they may move between multiple places. And besides this uh, story of what happens inland, you've also got the uh, connection to the intertidal areas. So you've got birds that feed on the coast that come inland to roost, either in the day or in the night. So many times our understanding of how coastal birds use uh, inland areas or, or main, uh, mainland areas is limited because people go out to study birds or see birds in the daytime. And you then see them coming inland and you say, okay, the birds are coming in the daytime, they're coming inland or you don't see birds coming inland during the daytime. But at night, you may have large flocks of birds coming in undetected and are using inland areas. So they depend on these inland areas without our knowledge. And so it's important to find out how it works and to protect these areas if we want to protect these species. And to understand these uh, movements of birds, I was, uh, happy to join a group of uh, bird watchers, volunteers, who were taking part in the International Water Bird Census in Oman. And we were uh, going, for, for a few years, we've been going to this incredible area called Baral Hikman, where uh, it's, a, it's a nature reserve and uh, there are very few people. And it's an ideal place to do some studies. And so we spent a few weeks counting birds. Um, in, in 2017, January, we had uh, over half a million water birds that we counted of various species. And here you can see just uh, a bit of it. Uh, it shows you flamingo, a lot of flamingo, but large numbers of shorebirds of many different species. And this was our team. We were living in tents on the beach and uh, counting birds and studying birds from morning to night. And at night, we were also catching birds for ringing. So. A uh, very intensive uh, 10 days, but very enjoyable to understand so much about how birds use these uh, coastal areas. And one thing that we did look at, and that talks about uh, connectivity, was how are the birds moving between the feeding areas and the roosting areas. So we were doing counts in um, particular areas so we could quantify the numbers of birds. We were coloring in the birds, as you can see this sandpiper here. A sandflower here. So we were able to individually identify uh, birds that were coming back to the same area during the different counts. We were doing counts across the entire tidal cycle. So as you can see here, we were sitting for up to seven hours at a time in one place and counting all the individuals that we could get in this area, which works out to one hectare. And you can see the initial results for some of these birds. So uh, less sand plover, the bird you saw earlier, little stint numbers change from low tide here, which is uh, zero between minus one and one. So some species move in and out, other species come main, mainly at one, one time. So you see a peak here or with curlew sandpiper, which is mixed in with some dunlin which are not easily identifiable with strong light, you can see very clear peaks of uh, activity in terms of numbers of birds that we recorded. And looking more broadly, the picture can be quite different for all the different areas along the Baral Hikman coast. These uh, circles are to show you 
the numbers of birds. So you can see there are concentrations of birds in different habitats. And this area has some of the most uh, mangrove here as well as here. Uh, so it's not necessarily that where you have mangroves, you have the most water birds, but uh, it, mangroves certainly add very good productivity to the soil and um, that, that makes uh, food nutri uh, make it makes it nutritious also for the birds to feed them. And if we take a more uh, zoomed out view, we use the term flyways, which are the routes that birds take uh, during their annual migration. This can be for a species or a group of species. And we divide the world for management purposes into broadly three flyways covering the um, Americas, the Asia Pacific, and the Africa Eurasia region. Or we can divide it into, like is shown here, for, uh, for nine flyways for the lo longest distance migrants, which are the shorebirds. It's useful just to be clear on what the definition of flyways is, and we encourage the use of a standard definition which was uh, put forward in 2006, because this quite neatly encompasses the meaning of flyway. And it says a flyway is the entire range of a migratory bird species or a group of related species or distinct populations of a single species through which it moves on an annual basis from its breeding grounds to non-breeding areas, including the intermediate resting and feeding places, as well as the areas within that the birds migrate. This means really these large areas from the breeding grounds to the non-breeding grounds. And because it is for a single species, a species that lives and migrates just within South Asia, for example, uh, let's say the Indian skimmer, has a very different flyway, but it falls uh, within the flyway of the, what we call the Central Asian flyway. So that's about the definition of flyways. And here is an example of how you can visualize the migration. Here you have Bar al Hikman in Oman, where colleagues and uh, collaborators are from Oman and the Netherlands and elsewhere are studying migration. They are linked to the Global Flyway Network. They have put satellite transmitters um, on, this, on the Bartail Godwit. Here is an example of a Bartail Godwit. And these Bartail Godwits fly north uh, to breed in this area. So their flyway is roughly in this area. Whereas another population of Bartail Godwit, which are using the west coast of Africa, where they were marked, they were, their migration took them along the Wadden Sea coast here in the Netherlands where I am, up across north to their breeding to their breeding areas here, and one individual even overshooting to go further east, and that came as an interesting surprise. So with every migration, we are learning a lot more about how birds are using the environment or how they may be changing in their migration. And two different subspecies of Bartail Godwit in, uh, in East Asia. One is marked here in Australia, one is marked here in New Zealand. And these birds, the New Zealand birds are flying nonstop more than 6,500 kilometers to uh, the Yellow Sea coast of China and Korea, stopping there for about a month. And then again, a nonstop flight all the way to Alaska where they are breeding. And after they finish breeding or nesting in, the, in, in these uh, months of July, August, September, then they'll start migrating south. And then many of these birds will fly nonstop from Alaska to New Zealand, a distance of 11,000 kilometers over the Pacific Ocean without a single stop, flying day and night. Uh, it's just incredible. This species is unbelievable to be able to do this. And uh, we are learning that the birds that breed here in Alaska mainly go down to New Zealand and go across here. So this becomes their part of the flyway. Whereas another population which is using this coast of Northwest Australia, stop by in, or uh, you, uh, overfly Indonesia, the Philippines, the China coast where they meet up with these birds here, but then they have a different route and go up to far Eastern Russia where they nest. So you can see that uh, even though the birds are going to very different destinations, their 
uh, in the breeding areas, they, they could be quite close by or even overlap as we can see here, which means that when we're talking about conservation and conservation in one flyway, we can't only focus on that flyway. We have, we have to see what's happening in adjacent flyways and share experience and best practice. <coughs> Excuse me for a moment. Besides the bar-tail godwit here, you've got a bonus of the migration of the wimbrel birds, which were marked here in West Africa, have also migrated all to, uh, to um, Iceland, where they are nesting. This is one pop population entirely breed there. So again, through satellite telemetry, we are learning a lot about migration of different species, which helps us to understand where should we be prioritizing uh, conservation action and protection. Here is the example of another little species, uh, the enigmatic spoonbill sandpiper, which nests in far easternmost Russia. You don't see the location of far easternmost Russia uh, in this map, so I'll just take you back for a moment. And these spoonbill sandpipers nest up here, and then they migrate through the Yellow Sea, through Southeast Asia, to Bangladesh, and to the uh, Sundarbans. Um, and in the past were also reported on the coast, uh, east coast of India down mm -hmm. to Sri Lanka. So going back to this uh, species, this little shorebird, um, there's been an international effort to, to protect and conserve them and to study them under what's called the East Asian Australasian Flyway Partnership, a, spe a special spoonbill task force, and uh, they have been uh, as part of the activities, they've been marking birds on the coast here in China with tiny satellite transmitters of mm -hmm. weighing just a few grams. And if I play this and this works, this should show you the movements of three of these birds. So here you can see how the birds go quite rapidly, stop in areas and then continue their migrations. And the places they stop at and migrate at, uh, migrate from are coastal mudflats, often at uh, adjacent to mangroves. So again, demonstrating the importance of these habitats. Um, in the introduction, Humayun talked about the Asian Waterbird Census, which is really a part of the International Waterbird Census, a global program that helps to understand what's happening about waterbirds. It's an annual program. It started in 1967 in Europe and started in, in India and in South Asia. Um, and Asia in 1987. And it's being done every year by volunteers, such as the Deccan birders. And I have to really commend the Deccan birders and the other bird watchers, um, both who are doing it just for fun as uh, enthusiastic birders or bird photographers or research scientists or forest department or uh, other government people who are doing it as a, as a hobby. So this is a huge scheme that depends on people around the world participating every year. And because of this program, we are collecting valuable information that helps to understand what is going on in terms of populations of water birds, uh, understanding the status and condition of the wetlands, and using the information to uh, prioritize conservation action to make people aware about uh, the importance of water birds in wetlands and to love wetlands and water birds. Only when you love something will you do something about it, otherwise you don't care. So uh, raising awareness and interest and love for the environment is extremely important in getting people to do something about it. Looking at coastal wetlands in 2017, we had a special Indian Ocean coastal water bird count. And uh, this was uh, very well uh, implemented by many of the countries in the Indian Ocean region and these stars just indicate the countries that were involved. Um, and again, <clears throat> we are very fortunate that the Deccan birders were very active in these counts and we got very good information from the coast of India and other countries. We were lucky that uh, the Timor-Leste, which is this little country here, uh, as adjusting to uh, Indonesia and Australia, also participated uh, in the census. We rarely used to get information from Indonesia, from uh, Timor-Leste in the past, but from 2017, we've been getting information from there as well. 
as well as the Brit British Indian Overseas Territory here, which is the southernmost tip of the Central Asian flyway. Uh, we've got information from there as well. So um, we learned a lot from that, and we hope that in the future we can continue to encourage all the countries to participate in the census annually, both on coastal areas as well as inland areas, because we are losing coastlines, we are losing coastal species. As I mentioned that this is really a volunteer effort. Down at the bottom here, you see a large group of volunteers from the state of Kerala. They have been involved in counting the water birds of the Vembanad Coal uh, Ramsar site every year. A uh, tremendous effort uh, and through the results over the last 30 years, we can really understand the changes in species numbers, different species going up, many species going down, um, as well as uh, total numbers of water birds changing. So uh, the, the heart of the census is, uh, as I said, the volunteers like uh, you as Deccan birders and the coordinators here is the state coordinator, uh, Dr. Namir for uh, Kerala. Um, and going one level above, uh, because this is a regional and a global effort, we also have national coordinators uh, from most countries in India, uh, in uh, Asia. And this was a meeting of coordinators in uh, a few years ago. And it was wonderful to see the enthusiasm and interest of all the coordinators in finding ways to uh, infuse interest in the local networks and to use the information being generated for conservation action. Just here, this diagram shows you the different linkages. So um, the volunteers who go out are uh, uh, here, the base of the census, and they send their information to Humayun here in uh, Andhra Pradesh and Telangana as the state coordinator, who then send it on to uh, the Wetlands International Office in Delhi, because the census in India is nationally coordinated jointly by Wetlands International as well as the Bombay Natural History Society. The information then is turned into national reports, national assessments is used for conservation action nationally, but that information is also sent forward to us in the Wetlands International Global Office here in the Netherlands, where we work with, uh, 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 we work with different regions. So for Asia, we are, serve as the re regional coordinator to collect information and provide flyway summaries to all of you and all this information is available in summarized form on our website, uh, so please do visit it. These logos are the logos of all the national coordinators that form the uh, network across Asia, from Pakistan eastwards to, uh, to Japan. One of the things that we've learned is that you can count water birds, but unless you look at the wetlands themselves, you're not going to understand what's going on. Uh, to the birds and so over the last few years we've been encouraging more information to be collected in a standardized form to understand what are the likely threats to the wetland as well as the threats to the water birds and you can see here these are the results of the first assessment and it shows you that domestic sewage is one of the most commonly reported uh, threats to the wetlands and as well agriculture which may not be a threat always but it can be a threat particularly if they're using a lot of pesticides and equal to that is uh, encroachment by residential and commercial development. We would like to encourage all participants to fill in the forms for this assessment every year so that we can on an annual basis see how things are changing at a local level in each state in India as a country but also in different countries across the different flyways. As part of that assessment, we also looked at the threats, uh, as I mentioned, and here you can see it became clear that uh, domestic dogs can, can be quite a problem for many water birds, both in coastal sites and in inland sites, as well as natural and artificial or man-made wetlands, where in many cases, well, here you can see 36% um, of, the, of the reports, of these 50 reports, uh, people reported that there were either few birds or many birds, um, uh, few dogs or many dogs that were disturbing the birds. And this picture is of a dog that's uh, eaten a little grebe. And uh, we've also seen them taking down flamingos and other people have reported many different species being affected. So disturbance by domestic dog dogs seems to be an increasing issue that we need to pay attention to. 
Um, another point was about fishing, where at many sites, um, well, a fourth of the sites you had reports of uh, fishing, um, 22 and 8%. Um, in many areas, we are not getting uh, responses, so these are blue here, but you can see there's little fishing, much or none, quite variable depending on the threat and disturbance. This is to understand whether the counts are properly done if the counts were disturbed. So here you can see that uh, a majority of the counts or 44% had no effect in terms of disturbance. So those are good counts. And if there are very disturbed counts, then you really should not uh, report them because it means that the information is incomplete. Besides uh, disturbance by dogs, the other issue that uh, participants have reported in previous years is that there's hunting and trapping happening of the birds at these wetlands and therefore the census is serving to be the eyes and ears on the ground to get up-to-date information of what's happening. As we know, according to the Indian laws, uh, hunting of birds is not um, allowed. So these are illegal activities and uh, there are efforts to try and understand better what's going on and to take action to stop them particularly uh, where this is a serious issue. So this baseline information that you and other participants, as the participants of the census are providing is extremely important at local level, but also when we aggregate it to national and international level. Um, moving on then, um, just to understand what are the reasons birds are declining. Well, I've talked a little bit about them in general from the census, but here, um, you're, you're presented with information and the reclamation of intertidal wetlands and coastal areas is one of the big problems. These are reclaimed for urbanization and other purposes, as I mentioned earlier, but also uh, for, for the production of fish ponds and uh, aquaculture ponds. This has been one of the main drivers for the loss of uh, intertidal and, uh, areas as well as mangroves. Something interesting is that around the year and around the world people are planting mangroves to restore mangroves but they are doing it in a way that may be ideal or they may be making mistakes because they don't know exactly how to do it and by planting in tidal flats where there were no mangroves before they're actually destroying uh, productive tidal flats and that's really bad so they need better knowledge and understanding of their impacts in order to uh, undertake better restoration activities. And this being the case, uh, through a number of different projects and programs, different organizations have been involved in raising awareness and best practice in, in terms of how best to restore mangroves. Where should you plant it? Where shouldn't you plant it? A couple of years ago, Wetlands International produced this brochure in English, but this was rapidly translated into, I forget, uh, 13 or more languages uh, and adapted for their use because this was uh, so critical to understand what was being done in, a, uh, in inadvertently uh, making a mistake. So some of the key messages in, in this uh, brochure were that, yes, the world needs mangroves. They have been lost. They provide a lot of um, important services and restoration may be necessary in some places, but how should you be doing that? It is, uh, it is a popular activity. In fact, uh, as, a, as a college student, I had the opportunity of going to Piroten Island in the Gulf of Kutch uh, Marine National Park in uh, Gujarat State in India and having my first experience of planting mangroves. We, were, we, we went and collected a large tray of uh, saplings of Avicennia. We were in large groups given uh, something to dig the soil and we planted the saplings. And uh, over the next few days of this nature camp, we went back each day to make sure that the plants were growing um, slowly and um, where there was algae grow, uh, swept onto the plants, we removed them to give the plants a fair chance of growing. And um, amazingly, that was uh, 19, 1982. And um, if I look at satellite images now of that area, the mangroves have grown quite well. So it shows that um, 
these efforts by school children, college students uh, as in a nature camp can also have a very good impact. But where you do it and how you do it is extremely important. So uh, we need to learn from those experiences. And it's not just planting one species in a large area because that's a plantation. What we don't want are plantations of mangoes when you're restoring mangoes, but really to be um, restoring the ecosystem, which means a variety of species of different shapes and sizes of species that allow for uh, the complexity of the mangrove forests to be restored. That's really important. You plant what are called pioneer species and the other species will follow. So there are many restoration principles that need to be followed um, and those are easily available. I'm not going to go into any of those details because you can find those on the web on our website. Just to, just to highlight what I've said before, that planting of mangroves in non-mangrove habitat or areas which, uh, which did not have mangroves is not the best thing because those areas are important for other biodiversity values, other uh, values for people. So we shouldn't lose good habitat because we are planting mangroves in, in those places. And we don't need to plant mangroves normally. Uh, we just need to give the mangrove saplings a chance to restore on their own because they are very productive ecosystems. And these species are pioneers. They, they find the perfect habitat and they will grow on their own if they are undisturbed. And um, just another point is that many areas of uh, coast, the coastline have been declared as uh, protected areas, uh, sanctuaries or national parks or Ramsar sites, I refer to the Ramsar Convention. There is also the World Heritage Convention or UNESCO, which uh, sites are declared as World Heritage Sites. There are flyway network sites in different flyways, such as the East Asian Australasian Flyway. And these areas are identified for their importance or the international importance for biodiversity, for water birds, for nature. And we need to make sure that we're preserving those different qualities in those sites. And uh, converting those sites by planting haphazardly uh, by mango uh, with mangroves or other species, we can be destroying these um, characteristics. So we have to be very careful. And it actually goes against the tenets of the management of these sites because you are changing the ecology and the ecosystem if you plant in the wrong place. I've, I've, I've said this often enough, but it's important to recognize that conservation and management of mangroves is necessary and a high priority. To understand what happens at the global level um, and where to prioritize mangrove conservation, coastal conservation, there have been a number of uh, different data sets that one can see on the net over time. And with a productive, um, with a productive ecosystem like mangroves, it means that these databases need to be updated as well uh, to keep uh, to be, to be active and um, up to date. So this is one website called the Ocean Viewer, Data Viewer, which was set up by UNEP, uh, United Nations Environment Program, WCNC, some years ago. And I'm just going through a few of them to give you a flavor of what's available. Another one which looks more at the intertidal habitat. Uh, this, is, uh, and this is the same group of people who, uh, whose paper and view I showed you earlier of the intertidal mudflats. This is an amazing tool, uh, which is available for mapping intertidal habitat worldwide. And it also allows you to look at change uh, when you compare one side of the graph to the, uh, of the image to the other, when you slide it back and forth, if the data is available. So uh, do have a look at this website. Uh, it's uh, using the Google Earth Engine. It's a new, it's a very new uh, development and a, quite an amazing one. Um, and something that all of you get a sneak preview to what will launch tomorrow um, is uh, the Global Mangrove Watch. This is another global uh, platform which has uh, slightly complementary features to what I've shown you before. And here it will summarize information per country among, about the amount of mangrove area as is shown here and it'll also have a number of other features and I'll switch to this slide which says here it will talk about the amount of area of biomass um, mangrove uh, that is available for that country 
as well as the extent of area of coverage of mangroves in that country. And you can find this for any country uh, in the world. Um, it'll, importantly, it'll look at the change in mangrove habitat. So where data points are available of previous information, uh, you would be able to, in an interactive way, choose um, the year you want to compare it to, and you could get an understanding of the gain or loss of uh, mangroves in that country. So this is uh, an interesting new tool that's being uh, developed. Uh, another um, set of information you will get is what is the height of the uh, canopy of the mangroves. Uh, all this is satellite data based uh, work, but importantly, it needs to be ground tested uh, in countries as well. And finally, the issue of blue carbon. We've talked about the carbon storage of mangroves. Uh, this uh, gives estimates of the amount of carbon being held, organic carbon being held in the mangroves themselves, as well as the underground um, bio, uh, sorry, underground um, carbon held in the soil. So these estimates are being presented. Um, I won't go into the detail because if you'd like to attend and learn more about this, there's a seminar, a webinar tomorrow. I'd encourage you all to join it. Uh, information on this webinar is available on our website, which is wetlands.org. I'll switch very quickly to some work which gives us hope for what is possible to do in an area where local people, unfortunately, over decades have undertaken activities that have destroyed the habitat, but are now willing to learn and at a community level, take action to conserve the area, supported by government uh, uh, action as well. So this is, I'm using a case study from the north coast of uh, Java in Indonesia, uh, where Wetlands International has an office uh, since the 80s and has been working with the local community here and other partners, a range of partners to first understand what has happened. And just to show you what's happened, well, the coast in the past used to be around here, but due to conversion of these areas into fish ponds and gr groundwater extraction, the tides destroyed the coastline. You had submergence and the entire area has been flooded for several kilometers inland, which has meant uh, both areas of coast which have large numbers of people, but also where there are villages and local livelihoods of people through agriculture have been greatly affected. This is an image of what it looks like. Uh, these, you can see concrete structures that have been lost uh, because of the uh, submergence of the coastline and, and the houses here that have been affected by it as well. This was a huge uh, problem and the community were very keen to try and take action. And over the last few years, several years actually now, we've been working there. And you can look at this coastline where through community-based conservation action, the mangroves have been planted, replanted in the areas where they existed and are coming back quite well. So hopefully this helps to protect the coastline now and into the future. And this was a very low-tech method of doing it. It was to build a shallow wall that stops the so uh, seawater when it's going out and the silt which is held in the seawater se uh, settles down and over time the silt builds up here. So to, to know how to do it, where to do it, all required a lot of study and working with the local community to get them involved in doing this. And it's been quite a success story. The government has found it as an important case study and is now um, involved in upscaling it to uh, several, I think a few, to a hundred kilometers or more off the coastline to try and deal with this uh, major issue of uh, submergence and eroding coastline. Here you can see the sediment trap uh, from that uh, simple bund uh, that was created. These are temporary, they could, they could be removed once the mangroves have grown back. But the important thing is that you stop the mud from flowing away and you trap new silt to give a, firm, uh, a soft area for the mangroves to grow again. Because one of the problems when, you, when the coast is eroding, the soft soil is lost and the hard 
underground uh, hard soil below does not allow plants to the saplings to grow so you need to give them an air of soft ground for them to catch their roots in and uh, mm -hmm. grow and this as i mentioned is now being upscaled to a very large area and it's looking not just at what it does for coasts and bringing back coastal ecosystems but importantly the livelihoods of local people which depend on uh, fish and fish products but because there are large numbers of uh, people living in towns and cities the idea is to look at how can you deal with the entire coastal area in a systematic way so don't deal with things on a piecemeal way but have a grand plan for the entire area involve the communities show them what works and hopefully over time you have images like this where mangroves have come back and the communities can uh, continue their livelihoods this is being upscaled even to a much larger area so there's a master plan for the entire coast that's being considered and this, this seems to be the only way to go that development must recognize how the environment and nature forms a part of it and it just short-term development and construction will never be uh, successful in the longer term so uh, through mistakes through experience through a lot of uh, effort uh, there is uh, this master planning happening here in in the coast on the coast of north java and as we know more and more people are living on the coast it means that this is not an isolated issue but we need to start looking more globally at how to make uh, urban wetlands along the coast and inland uh, serve their important fu functions uh, and serve and provide the services that they would provide if they are uh, uh, are allowed to remain there so this this image brings home some of the sorry brings home some of these messages that we can live on the coast we can live uh, in high density areas but we need to balance that with areas that are important for water for biodiversity as well as recreation and provide the livelihoods that people need to survive Mm, I, I have spoken for a little longer than I had expected to, but I've only got a few slides left. And uh, just uh, this is to talk about a new initiative which has started up a few years ago. And the reason I mention it is it was first conceived in 2012 at the uh, Convention on Biological Diversity, CBD, which had its COP11, Conference of Party 11, uh, in Hyderabad. And uh, there was recognition that coastal areas were being destroyed, but they are so important everybody needs to use them. The same mistakes are being made across the world. And why is it that we can't learn from other people's mistakes and share best practice? And so over the last few years, through working with the Convention on Biological Diversity, working with the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands, working with the IUCN um, Congress in 2016, and the CMS meeting in Manila in the Philippines in 2017. There were various uh, decisions and resolutions passed that interconnect with each other in order to provide a broader mandate for all the governments to work together to conserve and restore coastal wetlands, inclu including mangroves. And a steering group had been set up by BirdLife International, the CBD Secretariat, Wetlands International, and the Asia Pacific uh, Migrate, uh, sorry, the East Asian Australasian Flyway Partnership uh, Secretariat uh, to try and um, support the governments in these efforts. And uh, the main focus was to look at how could you help with increased prioritization of coastal global wetlands um, for conservation action and to support and coordinate these actions in restoration activities in some shape or way to set um, commitments and priorities towards coastal wetland restoration efforts. Um, I mentioned earlier that, for example, India has 39 Ramsar sites, but uh, only five of those have uh, mangroves on the coast. So there are, there are opportunities for protecting even more sites as Ramsar sites and managing them for the benefit of nature and biodiversity. We've learned that there are a lot. There is a lot of information, knowledge, and uh, experience. And that better sharing of that is extremely important at different levels. And uh, capacity building or strengthening is is a priority. And it's it's useful to find 
smart ways of dealing with that so that people can learn from experiences. And it is not something just that government does or just that local people do. It is something that must happen together involving all the key stakeholders, including governments, uh, private sector, local people. So this is something that is slowly progressing, uh, trying to understand what its best um, niche is, because there are many other initiatives and the idea is to be complementary. But that's at the intergovernmental level and we have to recognize that action has to happen on the ground. And here's an ex excellent example of initiatives being taken in India and elsewhere to try and stop the use of single-use plastics, one of the biggest problems uh, of these coastal wetlands. And uh, um, you, you must have seen these uh, images before. And uh, of course, uh, I, 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 I find it amazing how, where, uh, how local people in Mumbai, for example, uh, just came together and started cleaning up the beach, which, as you can see here, is extremely filthy. And uh, the success of that was uh, turtles came back to nest here. So now that is, that is just amazing. It shows you that where there is a will, there is a way. And we need to be making a difference by these local actions in small ways, but bigger actions uh, across countries and working together. And it's not looking at coasts separate to other areas. It's looking at nature as a continuum from the mountains, through the rivers and wetlands, through farmlands, cities and coasts, all together. And only when we look at nature as a whole and our relation to them, to nature, can we be making a difference, acting wherever we live locally, but working also at the higher levels where possible. So this um, is an image I leave you with. And I'd like to thank you all for this opportunity to speak. And we need to decide, it's our, it's our future really. Do we want a wetland to look like this, which has been trashed uh, because it's been turned into a fish pond and then abandoned? Or do we want to see pristine mangroves being restored on our coast so that biodiversity thrives, so our fisheries thrive, and our livelihoods are, at, uh, uh, are safe because these mangroves are protecting, protecting us from storms? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. That was indeed a wonderful presentation. Thank you. And we enjoyed that a lot. Lots of information to process today. Uh, Humayun Bhai, over to you. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Srikant. Thanks, Dave. That was absolutely a wonderful uh, this thing. And as you said, food for thought. Yes. Uh, so, mm -hmm. So uh, I would like to uh, I'll just proceed with the questions. We have quite a few questions on the chat right now. So I'll be proceeding with those, please. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, the first, yeah, the first question is by uh, Raj Shikhar. And uh, he asked uh, why mangroves are not considered CRZ 1, 2, 3, 4 in India. EIA projects cause a lot of havoc. Um, thank you. That's a very good question. I have to be honest and say I don't know the answers for these questions because they deal with uh, national with uh, what this is at the moment. Um, and so I'd suggest that uh, we can, if we can write down some of the questions for which we don't have answers, I'm happy to try and follow up with experts, perhaps uh, BC or others who are on this uh, webinar have the answers uh, as well. So. Uh, I think uh, it's good to have questions that are tough and difficult to answer, but uh, I hope we can find a way to, to give you answers for these. Okay. Thank you. And Rajshikar, I hope that answers your question. Uh, the next question is by Geetanjali Rajaram, and she asks, Andaman mangroves in Pichavaram too is depleting fast. What is being done in India to arrest them? Organizing boating in such places, does it help in educating people or damaging the mangroves because of the oil spill from these boats? Well, that's a good question. Um, it is possible to do tourism 
but better still ecotourism in a way that you minimize the impact your tourism is having on the environment. That should be the principle of how you deal with any protected area or non-protected area because uh, many of the areas that are important are not being designated as protected areas. So, for example, if, if you want to get people out to appreciate and understand the beauty of mangroves, it is good that they can be facilitated to get out there through using boats. Very often now, many wetlands have boats that are electric. So there, is no f there are no fumes, uh, there is no noise as well. So are, that's, the, that's a good way to go. You have boats with solar panels uh, so that you don't even need to get electricity from a distance. They can be um, operating on their, own <coughs> on their own steam, let's say. Um, but everything that is planned needs to be done in a way that recognizes the carrying capacity of the area. It needs to understand, as if you're talking about tourism, if you want to allow tourists to go by boat, you need to understand how, is, how big is the area that you're talking about, which, which parts of those areas can tourists visit, at which time, how many, in such a way that you are not destroying the area, damaging the area. Suppose you have birds that are nesting there at a certain time of year in, flock, in uh, colonies. You don't want tourists in large numbers to be going too close to them because you will scare the birds. Yes. So how can you plan tourism? I think tourism is important when it is done properly because as I said at the start, it is so important to love nature to, and to love something, you need to know what it is. It's not something that you read in the newspaper or see, in the, uh, see on TV and then you say, oh, it's something far away. We are not bothered with it. Where possible, mm -hmm. you can have personal experience. There's nothing like it. And it is possible to go out and see uh, wetlands in boats in small numbers without damaging uh, the habitat. I'm aware uh, that there's even an effort, I believe, in southern Maharashtra of um, ecotourism using boats in an estuary being organized by a women's group. So that helps to bring local income to the to the local women living in the area and they're apparently doing it very well perhaps there's lessons to be learned from that um, so i think there are good examples of how to do it properly there's also a wealth of information about the mistakes made so if anyone is planning to do something please do look at the literature on best practice of that particular ecosystem type and for mangroves it is possible to organize some boat tours, ideally, um, by electric boat or even by, uh, by canoe. People can use their own canoes, or meaning you can hire a canoe and uh, mm -hmm. you can go in uh, as a canoe trip on your own, which has, uh, has great value as well and limited uh, disturbance. I hope that helps to answer that. Yes, yes. Thank you. Actually, that was that was quite quite an interesting thing to understand. Hope Gitanjali, you got your answers. Uh, next question is from Adnan. Could you please throw some light on mangrove nursery banks and how effective they are for conserving mangroves? Um, well, there's a lot of examples of good places where mangroves are grown. Uh, you're using the term mangrove banks. So you, yes, uh, to nurseries where mangroves are, are, are grown, saplings are produced, and then the mangroves are transplanted. There are good examples from in many, many, many places of that. So uh, it's easy to find. And the important thing is, do you need to plant a mangrove sapling? Why and where and when? In addition to where would you get the mangrove from? If you're talking about an area on the coast uh, where there are few people and there are mangrove uh, plants in the distance, let's say, the seeds of the mangroves will be brought in by the tide and if the conditions are right, they will germinate on their own. That's how mangroves spread. So it is, we can expect that with minimum natural 
with minimum human interference or action, mangroves will come to areas where they should be growing easily. If the mangroves have been completely wiped out and you have no seeds of mangroves in that area or uh, in a large area, then planting mangroves in areas where you've lost it to restore those mangroves is important. And again, depending on the area, is it estuarine? It is, a, is it a main coastal area? Is it an island? What is the soil condition? What are the water conditions? Mm -hmm. um, all this will de determine which species you plant, when you plant it, how dense you plant it, uh, if you have to plant it. So there's, there's a lot of uh, more information that you need. And I, I wouldn't be in the best place to give that information, but uh, it's available. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And uh, Adnan, I hope that answers your question. Uh, so uh, just moving on to the next question, sir. Um, the next question is... Uh, yes, actually, the next question is by me, sir. And uh, uh, what I've typed in is, uh, what, uh, how can the mangroves survive in saline environment? How do they survive? Well, um, mangroves have the ability to prevent salt water coming into them through their roots. Yes. And when the salt water, when the uh, salt comes into the roots, they have the opportunity or the mechanism to excrete them through the leaves. So that's how they can keep the salt out um, and not affect them. And they, they have adapted to live in those situations. So that's, uh, that's their special characteristics. That's uh, characteristic, let's say. Okay. okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you You're welcome. Uh, for that. And uh, the next question is uh, by Humayun Tai. And he says, to what level can mangroves survive total inundation? Well, you've got, you've got areas where you have tides on a daily basis, uh, single tide, you have areas you have two or one and a half tides a day, uh, depending on the location. And um, so you can have mangroves that are flooded for several hours in a day. Estuarine mangroves sometimes, particularly further up the estuary, can, be, can, can withstand um, near con continuous inundation, let's say, um, and, and do well. I think there's a lot of variation depending on the species of mangrove. Again, I'm not an expert, but it's just from my experience of where I've seen mangroves growing so right, Avicennia may not grow, but Rhizophora may grow, or some other species may grow, depending on where it is. Oh. Thank you, sir. And uh, the next question is by Jivini Uncle uh, Jivini Murthy. So the question is, what effects of climate change are seen in mangrove ecosystem? Mm. Will rising sea levels severely affect mangroves? Um, good question. When you have the sea coming up and the going up on the coast, whatever is growing there is under pressure. If you have groves or you have salt marsh or um, open coast, the impact is going to be different. With mangroves, uh, sorry, I should go step back one. What is important is behind the mangroves, what exists? Is there a concrete wall? Is it a field? Flat ground? Because when the sea level rises on one side, from the seaward side, let us if there is space behind the mangroves and the water level becomes, uh, rises such that the land behind also becomes saline over time. Sea level rise doesn't happen over time. It happens over years. So then you have the salt water going further back inland and that makes the conditions for new mangroves to grow behind the existing mangroves. And th that land is higher. So it means that mangroves could over time move back towards the land if the land is free for it. But one of the big problems is 
there are coastal roads, there are highways, there are pipelines, there are buildings, there's construction. So, or agricultural fields have buns, which means that the mangroves cannot migrate backwards or and inland and upwards. Yeah. Therefore, if there is sea level rise and uh, the conditions are such that the mangroves cannot grow, then they will die out. And mm -hmm. before they die out, the intertidal mudflats will be lost and everything else that depends on those intertidal mudflats will also be having to find a new place. So in, in fact, in planners, uh, in planning, many countries are now looking at what they call coastal retreat, which means you don't build on the coast, you build at a slight elevation behind and how far back you come depends on the slope of the coast. If it's a very steep slope, then you don't need to go too far back to be high of the and above the predicted mm -hmm. height into the future. Whereas if it's a flat coast, you'll actually have to go back se maybe several kilometers even, depending on the time frame you're looking at in terms of your uh, planning perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, to add to that, I remember reading somewhere, I'm trying to recall where it was, that the sea levels would rise and the mangroves would be drowned, inundated in the next 30, 40 years. Yes. Because of climate change. Yes. Well, the entire coast and the, the entire, the world, uh, the coastlines of the world are going to rise. How fast they rise and where they rise is, is a matter of location. So, um, it is important that we do think ahead. Mm. How do we want to plan our coastlines for the future? And that means thinking now for making space for mangroves, for intertidal mudflats, for sand beaches into the future. Otherwise, we are giving nature no space to survive and adapt. And that's going to have huge consequences on our own survival. Yeah, but then the political will has to be there for that to be implemented. Absolutely. That's the biggest problem. Yes, political will is important and the, low, and, uh, the awareness and understanding of the local population is also extremely important because when people recognize that there is a risk, they will make a noise about it and then their political will will respond to people's needs. So again, awareness raising about the environment, about intertidal wetlands and the risk to them is something that we need to really uh, enhance so that people are aware of what are the risks of living in coastal areas and, and low-lying areas basically. So the key word would probably be then uh, community participation which uh, BC had mentioned in his last webinar when he spoke to us a month back. Okay yes absolutely nothing will happen without community participation support and interest. Right. right. So that is critical and that participation will come with understanding awareness and awareness so we need to find ways to get local people everywhere to understand what is happening through their own actions through actions of others and through natural processes and a combination of that means that they are at the highest risk in many areas and they they need to be planning for their future uh, if I may uh, add one, a small a bit here, mangroves are seen as non-productive. Non-productive? Non, 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 non they're not useful in any sense commercially. Yeah. So which means that uh, getting that, raising that awareness level is going to be a huge, huge battle, uphill battle, I would say. Well, um, in many places, uh, mangroves are produced through uh, production mangroves. So you've got areas of natural mangroves, but you've got also plantations of mangroves. Right. And you have plantations of mangroves. Mangroves are being produced and harvested on, on, on a different uh, life cycle, maybe a 30 year cycle or whatever. And that mangrove wood is then sold commercially for okay. different purposes All in right. the past and perhaps now in many countries for charcoal mangrove charcoal or the poles are used for fishing and uh, house construction and it's uh, other purposes so mangrove wood is valuable timber 
Okay, okay. So it it depends on uh, the the production system and the uh, the uh, what should I say the permit system that uh, exists right. in an area. Thank you, thank you, Dick. Oh, I mean, if I may just add, I think mangroves also. Um, I mean, they the network probably for the goods and services which I was reading online uh, earlier was about a hundred over a hundred million dollars uh, per year. So the goods and services which come through the mangroves. So I think absolutely they do add they do add certain uh, um, this thing to our GDPs as well. So yeah. no question about that. I mean, mangro to say mangroves have no value means the uh, person saying it just is not aware of what mangroves are worth and. Um, if you look at single uses or functions as a nursery for fish or nursery for shrimp, these natural mangroves are extremely important. Without, the fishery industry will collapse. And that's what was seen in many countries and on in, in, in many areas that when you've destroyed your mangroves, your fishery industry drops. And that means the poorest of poor people upwards don't get fish and their livelihood daily subsistence is affected so mangroves to the local people are very important and many community-based mangrove restoration programs are very successful because the farmers are and the fishermen are benefiting from the protection of the mangroves and there are smart ways to have fish farms aquaculture ponds which are done in a way that bring the mangroves in and they are part of the production cycle rather than cutting down all the mangroves. Yes. Thank you, sir. And uh, just to say, I mean, uh, most of our uh, listeners here have given a lot of appreciation for the talk. They say excellent, wonderful, informative, insightful. These are a few adjectives used by our uh, listeners. So thank you so thank much you. again, sir. So the next thank question you. is by uh, Gubala Ramakrishna Raugaru. Uh, the question is the planting technique which you have shown as bunt planting in Godavari and Krishna mangroves, raising mangroves in fishbone model. Any advantage in bunt type more than the model which we are practicing? Well, thank you for your question. Um, I have to say, I'm not a mangrove <laughs> expert, uh, and so I wouldn't want to give you advice that is uh, that is ill informed. And I, if, if you are able to send your question, I could forward it to colleagues who uh, can answer that or put you in touch with others who might have that information. In, in India, we have an office in Delhi, uh, Wetlands and National and South Asia program, and they have uh, been working in, in various places where there are mangroves or are in touch with people who know more about mangroves, and uh, we'd be happy to try and get that uh, information back to you. So please do, please do share that. Sure, sir. I, I would share that with you. And uh, the next question is uh, by Falguni Behra. And the question is, long seashore transportation is one of the major cause of degradation of mangrove. How to overcome to restore it? I'm trying to think what exactly what is meant by the question. Um, so, uh, because of the seashore transportation which is happening, I mean, um, there is a degradation of mangroves. So, how do we overcome to restore restore the mangroves again? So, probably. Okay. Again, um, mm -hmm. what we have seen um, is that maintaining normal coastal flows is very important. The moment you build a port or you build a construction out, you change the coastal hydrology. And when that happens, either close by or sometimes several kilometers or 100 kilometers away, the, uh, the shoreline is affected. Either there is accretion of material or there is uh, erosion. So again, uh, when we are looking at conservation of coastlines, one needs to take a much larger scale and have a landscape scale plan of what is going to be done where, so that these kind of actions in one location 
don't completely compromise the security and integrity of coastline elsewhere. I think that is the only thing to say um, in, in the broad sense. And specifically in a location, there could be um, solutions to try and deal with uh, mangrove uh, restriction or keeping the mangroves in um, if, if, if necessary. But again, it would be good to get advice of people who understand this better than myself. Uh, so I think that answers uh, your question, Fangini. So the next question is by Satvik. Question says, as dogs are the major threat to these coastal birds, what measures can be taken to control this or put a stop to it? Well, that's a good question. Um, unfortunately, the numbers of uh, feral or domestic dogs that are going wild um, are increasing in many areas and that's causing a huge problem to wildlife in general. It's being seen in open areas as well as within protected areas. And I think it, it really needs uh, some soul searching. How can we as, a commun as local communities in each area deal with this issue? In some places, uh, the dogs, feral dogs are picked up by local municipalities or authorities, but what they do with them depends on the area in terms of dealing with them. And if it's only releasing dogs from one area to another, they're only transferring the problem to someone else's backyard and that does not necessarily solve it. So uh, there needs to be other ways found to deal with the problem. But sterilization of stray dogs is, is one way to try and deal with it. It does depend on the numbers and uh, densities of dogs in an area. And if the numbers keep increasing, they are causing, they are bound to cause problems on the uh, wildlife, especially when the wildlife itself is threatened the loss of one individual or two individuals of a species can be a big problem. So um, one has to be very careful about this um, issue. Yes, thank you. And I think the next question uh, by Satrik again is, is there an example where we can see mangroves growing on a plain sea coast with no river nearby? As we are, yes, sorry, please go ahead. No, please continue with the question. Yeah. And uh, as we often see mangrove vegetation in the estuarine regions. Yes. So, yeah. so, so man th there are uh, mangroves that grow best in estuarine, estuarine areas. Basically, mangroves need fresh water and salt water. And that's where they grow best. So estuaries which bring fresh water in constantly help to uh, encourage rapid growth of mangroves. Whereas if you look on the west coast of India, say in Gujarat, in the Gulf of Kutch, it's a semi-arid area. And you've got mangroves in several areas where the rainfall is just a few hundred millimeters a year. So the amount of fresh water coming in to the coast is limited because whatever is, being, is falling as rain is being harvested by people. So you've got very little water going to the coast. Even so, in India or elsewhere in, in West Asia, in the Gulf countries, you will see that there is mango, there are mangroves growing. They may be stubbier, may not grow as tall or as luxuriant as other mangroves where they grow in, in the estuaries, but you can still have mangroves growing to se uh, several meters um, in areas where there is no rainwater or very limited fresh water coming in. Thank you, and uh, Satrik, I hope that answers your question. So uh, the next question is uh, by Miss Melba from Philippines, and she asks how to control the pest infestation on mangroves caused by defoliators. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that question. Uh, I have to be honest, uh, I have no answers for that myself uh, because it's not something I do, but I'm sure uh, in the Philippines, there should be information available from the government department that deals with uh, mangroves. So the DENR uh, in the Philippines uh, should be uh, a good point of entry to get such information. If not, um, maybe there are some universities who are doing research on this, um, or maybe if you go to, um, maybe if you visited the Olango, um, 
uh, sanctuary. You can you can ask the uh, the local authorities there. But uh, I have to say that I don't have that information myself. I can try and find it for you if you need. But I'm sure in the Philippines you be, you will be able to access that information easily. Yes. So uh, Melba, I hope that answers your question. And if you have any queries, please do uh, drop in your email, and uh, we can we'll be able to correspond with patient and put you to the right people. So the next question yes. is by Ragupati Garu. He asks, uh, what are nematophores and what is their function? So I think it's more like the nose for the mangroves. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. That's a nice way to put it. Yes. Nematophores are breathing roots. And uh, because, the, uh, because the plants are growing in water, they cannot uh, absorb air within the soil because the soil is waterlogged. In order to be able to get air from the soil, they grow these special fingers or roots, uh, which could be uh, very thin structures growing up or um, woody, which have holes in them through which they can absorb air. Yes. They are breathing roots. Yes. So, Raghupati Garu, I hope that answers the question. So, basically, it's the function of the nose for us. And different species of mangroves have different shapes and sizes and numbers of breathing roots. So, for example, if you visit an area where the species Avicenna um, is, is growing, before you reach the plant itself, you can see rows of, of small roots growing out of the sand or the mud um, that are exposed at low tide. And uh, at high tide, obviously, they are covered. But during the low tide, because they are uh, exposed to the air, they are able to breathe um, and when they get submerged, then they just uh, stop um, serving that function. So, uh, so just an extension to that, when you said stop serving their function, so they don't breathe, so how do the plants get the oxygen from, I'm sorry, the, the carbon dioxide from? Rather? Well, plants uh, are able to uh, absorb uh, oxygen, uh, oh sorry, air. air. Uh, through the through the nematophores as well as through the leaves. Yes. So not that they can't get it through the leaves. Oh, okay. Right. So uh, the next question is by uh, the DFO from uh, Himachal Pradesh, uh, Mr. D. S. Dadwan, and he says, "Time to start a platform on sharing knowledge and experience at landscape level for better management interventions." Your opinion on it? Well, no question that that's a, that's a high priority. In fact, uh, there is no way we can manage these islands of the environment on their own because the environment is connected directly uh, by the air, by the soil, by the water. And um, the only way to deal with it is looking at it at a landscape scale level and identifying how these pieces of the environment fit together and how can we manage in such a way that management actions further upstream do not affect the downstream. Um, I think that in my last slide, I had shown how we need to look from the mountains down to the coast and everywhere in between. And it's that landscape scale where we need to be planned, where the governments need to be facilitating and managing and organizing planning. And then the different components can be implemented by uh, the different players. And this is particularly important in, in countries where riverine systems, uh, river systems are long and cross multiple state boundaries. So in, in order for water to reach from the mountain to the sea, and it should reach the sea, otherwise we cannot replenish coastal ecosystems, there needs to be an agreement on how that water is used and managed and kept clean. Yeah. Not task but a very important one very important one. yes thank you sir and uh, that's also i hope it is answered the question has been answered to you uh, the next question is by faru mr ramon garu from uh, uh, telangana so he asks how does indiscriminate extraction of groundwater affect mangroves I guess it's a it's it's a question that really can be answered in a couple of ways. First, it depends on the scale at which the water is being extracted, the amount of mangroves we're talking about, where are those mangroves, and how does it affect the 
uh, groundwater situation. So it's not such an easy answer to give uh, as, as a single answer. It's really site specific. Right. I'm sorry, uh, that's, that's probably the easiest answer in the time available. That, and that is correct. Consider the locations. Yes. And uh, the next question is uh, I think by uh, Shravan Kumar Raila and uh, he says, at mangroves, Avicenia look, looks like shrub and sometimes they look like trees. Please explain. Uh, well, it depends on their phase of growth. If you're talking about younger plants, they will look like shrubs and over time they will become trees. So that's uh, that's one thing to consider. The other thing is it depends on the uh, on the conditions under which those plants are growing. Um, as we mentioned earlier, estuarine systems often mean that the conditions are perfect for growth and there the, uh, the plants will grow the tallest and the most luxuriant, whereas where the, uh, where the environment is not perfect for them or rain is limited or there is constant cutting of the plants, they will, won't get a chance to grow. And um, something worth mentioning here is while I was working in the Gulf of Kutch in Gujarat, uh, it, it was a period of multiple years of drought. And it meant that the farm, that the uh, camel herdsmen did not have any uh, forage for their camels. And the easiest way for them to get uh, forage for the camels as well as for the cattle, the cows and, uh, and buffaloes was to go into the mangroves, cut down the mangroves and feed them to the cattle. And the camels would themselves walk into the mangroves and feed on the leaves. And the large feet of the camel meant that they would crush the young saplings of the, of the Avicinia. As also some rhizophora, but mainly the Avicinia. And so as a result, the, the, the regrowth was being, was being affected by the camels. And the plants themselves were very stunted to the height at which the camels would feed on them from the top. So you had bushy mang mangroves in those areas. Huh. Quite, quite, quite an interesting observation, actually. Thank you, uh, Shravan. I think your questions, are, uh, your question has been answered. So, uh, I think the next question is uh, from Cecilia Devdas. Is any any efforts are in operation in, in and around Koleru wetland in Andhra Pradesh? Mm. Well, I I don't know the details of what's going on now. But I had the good fortune of being part of a team that looked at developing a management action plan for Koleru more than a decade ago. And uh, that action plan was developed with the State uh, Forest Department um, to help them to better manage this site, which was declared as a Ramsar site. That, should be, that, that management plan should be available with the authorities and uh, possibly also with uh, uh, with Wetlands International on its website uh, for the South Asia office. Um, but that's, that's a long time ago. And so I don't know what the current situation is in terms of implementation of the action plan or updates of the action plan. Yes. Um, but it's a very important area and I'm very glad that Deccan birders are doing the counts there every year for the water bird census and that should continue. And if possible, counts should be extended to other times of the year as well, because as we know with Koleru and other wetlands, the birds that use these sites are using uh, wetlands that are changing by the months. The water levels are dropping, the vegetation is changing. So the usage of different species changes at these wetlands. So the more we understand about these wetlands by increasing the frequency of counts, I think we would get a better appreciation of the real value of these wetlands. And Koleru is one, one good example where there's a lot more to learn about the true value of those wetlands. And when you understand that better, you'd be able to manage these wetlands better. So management plans are dependent on the best information. So we need to uh, build that information. In fact, one of the main action points within the action plan we developed in 2007 was to strengthen the monitoring of water birds as well as the monitoring of the wetlands yep. in order to give the best advice as to where 
and how to change management practices in order to manage those wetlands in a more sustainable manner. Right, thank you. Uh, so, um, Mr. Devdas, I hope the question is answered. And uh, just to add to that, if you need any further information, uh, you can contact us, um, anyone from the EC, and we, can, we would be able to uh, guide you in the right way. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, we have one last question, sir, and uh, this is by Dr. Varsha Trivedi. And uh, she asks, in which manner salt marshes, habitat, and mangrove attract migratory birds? Hello, in doctor. Which, in which manner do they visit? Uh, yeah, in which manner they attract. I mean, uh, the migratory birds are attracted to salt marshes habitat, uh, mangrove salt marshes. Okay, so if we if we talk about an area, um, say the coast of uh, Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, uh, down to down to Tamil Nadu, that coastal area is um, is supporting migratory birds that come along the Central Asian Flyway that breed up in the Arctic, in Central um, Central Asia, Mongolia, China. They come down to the coast. So during the months of October to March, April, you will have large numbers of birds on these uh, in these habitats, the, mang uh, the mangroves and coastal mudflats uh, adjoining these mangroves. How do the birds use the habitat? Well, in the low tide, they, the birds will be feeding on the shrimp, on the worms, on the, on the mussels, um, clams, crabs in the mudflat. And at high tide, you may have some of these birds going to roost in the mangroves or in flat areas within the mangroves that uh, don't have vegetation as uh, they could be like a bit of a grassland or something grassy patch. Then the birds will disappear what look like they're flying into the mangroves, but they're actually landing on uh, drier areas within the mangroves and resting there. And at the next low tide, they will be back to the coast and feeding there. So that's how birds would normally use any area, whether it's mangroves or if um, it's uh, salt marsh, uh, that could be a similar kind of use. So basically they would come to roost at high tide. And if the birds are nectar feeders, sunbirds or others, they would be uh, feeding uh, in, the, in the flowers of the mangroves when, when they are flowering. And there are a lot of insects that are attracted by these flowers. So those bring in a variety of insect eaters as well. So different birds would use the mangroves in a different way, depending on the species of the mangroves, the amount of mangrove area available, and uh, the species of birds that live in that broader region. Yeah. Um, thank you, sir. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Varsha, I hope your question has been answered. And uh, yes, I can see that. Thank you. Uh, so uh, that, that's it. I think uh, we're done and with the questions. Uh, thank you for being uh, patiently answering all our questions. Thanks a lot. And uh, I think uh, JVD uncle, are you here? Very much here. Yes, I, mean, <laughs> I, I, I was, uh, I should have said muted. Unmute you. So yes. No, I'm, so, I'm please. Muted yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, JVD uncle, I would like to, uh, like to hand it over to you, please. Thank you, Tej. Or to be very formal, Dr. Tej Munkar, that was a wonderful talk. I thoroughly enjoyed every moment of the presentation, I'm sure, as did the others. I hope you enjoyed the interaction with some of our members here. Absolutely. And this was something I remember having told you about, that you have to reckon with the time going past your uh, uh, tea time, maybe, mm -hmm. with the number of questions that keep going <laughs> to the other. Uh, we are basically amateurs, but uh, very keen on conservation and the issues regarding birds and nature conservation. So the questions, they never seem to stop. So I'm glad you found the time to be with us today. And thank you once again for accepting our invite. We hope to have you over again sometime on maybe uh, a topic of something uh, which is mutually interesting. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak today and uh, I'm, I'm happy to have been able to answer some of the questions. Uh, 
think in reality we are all amateurs. <laughs> <laughs> there is so much to learn about everything. And the moment somebody decides that they are an expert, they've really told themselves that they don't want to learn anything new. And yeah. that never be the case. So it's, it's a lifelong journey and amateurs world over have made the real difference to conservation. So it is the power to conservation, uh, the power of amateurs that, that have really made a difference for nature conservation and the environment. So uh, if it wasn't for the volunteers and amateurs, we wouldn't have the longest running global international water bird census. So uh, I can't say anything more than that. It's just fantastic that there are people who have daily jobs and are busy with other things, but have the interest in nature and love for nature and conservation and are able to participate in these talks and, and through the rest of the year are so busy doing things for, uh, for supporting awareness raising and conservation action. So I really thank you all uh, taking time out on, to be on, this, uh, on this webinar and thank you, Mr. Murthy, for giving me the opportunity. If there's future opportunity, I'd be happy to, to, to discuss that with oh, you. Oh, that's lovely. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so, so much, sir. Thank, thank you. you. So I'm able to devote time to my passion after retirement five years ago as the as a professor of German. <laughs> oh, wonderful. <laughs> yes. But thanks, thank again. thanks again. Thank you. Thank you so much, thank sir. You. Thank you so much for your talk. And we really, it was very informative. So I thank all the participants who joined us and making this, uh, and giving us so many questions. Uh, David Yanko, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, we have recorded this on YouTube. Uh, Srikant, could you just send the link to uh, Tage, please? Yes, yes, I, I would just share it with him. Yeah, the okay. YouTube link can be then uh, shared to him and uh, all the yes. other webinars are also on that link. Sure. Yes. So uh, we, have, we also had uh, uh, quite a few number of uh, listeners on Facebook. So thank you all for joining us today on Facebook as well. So it was great. Uh, thank you. So Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. And please do join us next Sunday again. We have an, another webinar coming in. The invites would be sent out very soon. That would, that would be on the colonial nesting birds of Bitar Kanika. Yes. Very good. <laughs> yes. I'll, I'll try and join it if I can. If not, I'll definitely watch it on the, uh, the live streaming recording afterwards. So thank you for letting me know this. Thank you. Dr. Gopi GV from the Wildlife Institute of India. Oh, wonderful. Yes. Uh, Dr. BC Dr. put Dr. me in touch with him. BC is an old friend. He put me in touch with him. And yes. Dr. Gopi very kindly agreed to give us a talk on the colonial nesting birds of Bithar Kanika. Excellent. I think the work that they've been doing, uh, both Gopi and the Wildlife Institute over the last years there, has really helped get a better and a deeper understanding of the importance of Bithar Kanika. So it will be really an informative talk. Good. Uh, we'll, we'll send out the details to you very soon. So. Thank you. So, okay. Thanks a lot. Okay, Tish. Nice listening Thanks. to you. Pleasure talking to you all. And uh, thank you for staying on so long. I really didn't expect it to be uh, something that will keep everyone busy for two hours. But I can't believe that the, uh, that the time has just uh, flown by. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I, I actually, uh, I'll use all the adjectives which people have used. Insightful, exciting, and amazing. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you, sir. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And thanks, Srikant, for hosting it. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.